should I start? Okay, is it okay to start? I think we're a little bit ahead of time, but can you guys hear me okay? Five minutes, yeah. Five minutes, yeah. Uh, I'll keep talking. Can you hear me back there? No? You can't hear me in the middle. I'm sorry, guys. Uh, this talk is canceled. Uh, <laughs> No, actually, I have good news. Uh, there's some drink tickets here. Uh, and he is in charge of no. dispensing those to the most active participants. And uh, bad news, not that just, we just lost the drink tickets. I don't know where they are. <laughs> actually, and I'll, I'll get you some more uh, drink tickets. After that. Okay. All right. I'm not going to say no. Uh, you found them now, right? Are we okay to start? Should we start? Yes. All right, well, allow me to introduce the speaker. The uh, speaker today is Jay Jacobs. All right, no, I'm, I'm Jay. Um, I, uh, I'm going to talk about data visualization. It's something that I absolutely love, and I'll probably get a little animated and walk around and get all excited and stuff. So is this working out? I'm going to be walking around. Good luck getting that on the mic. But All right. So I've been working in information security for about 15 years. Uh, I moved into cryptography. I thought that we could solve the problem with math. And so I spent uh, many years working in cryptography and uh, rolling out key management and uh, making and breaking crypto systems. And I realized quickly that the, the math is a problem solved. We can encrypt data, pass it through the hands of our adversary and have it be just fine, right? We've solved that problem. The problem comes in key management. And then we start talking about risk, right? And so I got into risk analysis, and I was really intrigued by how we assess, our, assess and measure our exposure to loss. And then I quickly realized that risk analysis is nothing more than a fancy way to say data analysis. And most of the data analysis that we do in risk is around opinion. So that led me into data analysis, though, and how we handle and manipulate data. And that naturally transitioned into data visualization as a way to communicate that. So in my day job, I work at Verizon, work on the data breach report. Um, and I've done a whole bunch of analysis over the last year, new analysis, stuff that hasn't been on the report yet. And I put it all on our blog, at the Verizon blog. And, and you saw on the title, it's right here. This is a map of the internet. So this is right about where I blog. So if you want to find it, it's right there. All right, so here's my first presentation on the agenda. We're going to talk about why to visualize, how we see it, being practical about it. I'm going to go through a few flat out lying ones. Don't have a whole lot of time. Those are the most fun, typically. But, and then I'm just going to walk through some work and some of the some of the things that we talk about. So, one of the things that that I challenge in our industry is we do a lot of of guessing and we do a lot of um, when we state things. It's mainly based on stories that we hear. Right? It's, it's based on anecdotes, and it's based on um, sort of the, the shiniest uh, star in the sky or the biggest headline or things like that. And so one of the ways that we can combat that is with, with data and data analysis. But based on all the, the stories that we have, this is another applicable slide here. Right? The plural of anecdote is not data. So a collection of stories pushed at you as a practitioner can really cause all sorts of biases and things like that and how you judge the security of an environment. And so one of the ways is to, to move into this data uh, aspect, right, as I mentioned. So one of the, one of the things that I got really interested in is, is we talk about risk analysis. Since most of it is based on opinion, I wanted to know how we formed our opinions, how we, how we became experts, right? So one of the things that I came across was uh, a guy, uh, Simon is his last name, and he studied chess players and how they become really good chess players. And he made the conclusion that they play really good chess based on their intuition. And their intuition is nothing more than a collection of memories that they have. So they're able to look at a board and recall that pattern. It's a recognition of pattern and memory. And so 
looking at that, thinking that intuition, how we become intuitive security people, right, and that's largely what we have. We've got experts that become experts by being in the field, right? They become experts by, by a collection of patterns in their memory. And so these patterns are imprinted through these stories that we hear, right? How many people are, are very familiar with the RSA breach and what happened? Right? How many people think that the risk of phishing went up right after that? Right? So there's, there's a correlation there. There's some, some things that we hear. So these stories are really important. So as we get into data visualization, it's no wonder that in this field, they always talk about telling stories with data. Right? We're not talking about like the cold hard, let's throw some formulas up and spit out a number. Let's create a visualization to tell a story. Right? Let's figure out what the message is and get that story across. So what is data visualization? I really like this definition because it has the word exploits in it. So what, what we're trying to do with data visualization is essentially communicate a message in a way that exploits how the human brain processes visually. Right, a lot of the things that we deal with are incredibly complex. There's so many things that we're trying to communicate at once, and words fail at complexity oftentimes. Even numbers and charts, right, or you know, tables. And so using a visual perception, we're able to communicate a whole lot more complexity. So this is an example. This is from the 1850s, early data viz, right? This is drawn by hand. This is a map in London. They had a cholera outbreak, and a doctor took the depths that they had from cholera and created these bar charts at the address. Right? And he quickly realized that there was a pattern to this, and this is an updated version. So all of the red and the size of the red are the depths, and the blue are water pumps that they had in London. And they're all centered around this blue water pump, all of the depths. So the, the doctor went to this water pump and removed the handle, and the cholera outbreak succeeded. Right? And he did that through visualization like this. And it said that this is the birth of epidemiology. So how we see, let's talk about that. So when we visualize data, we've got a couple of things to work with, right? Shape, size, color, position, and a bunch of other things, right? Different types of variables that we work with, either in a category or a, a continuous scale of data. And we've got proportions and relationships and an element of time oftentimes or spatial. You know, like that map we just looked at, the relative space of them. And all of those have different ways in which the human brain processes that. Right? So at the, that's sort of scary. Right there. <laughs> so this is, uh, some research was done, and this is specifically around quantitative data. So the things at the top, the brain is able to easier see and, and decode from, from a visual, and these become a little bit more cloudy. Right, the accuracy of decoding these in the human brain become a little bit more sh shady, basically. So if we can put things on positions or length, even some of the angle and slope, they're going to be better than looking at the, the color hue. And this is for quantitative data, or the area, things like that. And I've got some samples of these. Um, more work was done looking at other types of data. Can you see this? Yeah. This is his face. The guy was right here. Um, the, uh, Why am I on the quantitative side? Yeah. <laughs> So this is looking at the other types of data, right? So as we, as we talk about quantitative data, the position length, those help with quantitative, but as we get into order, the order of data, first, second, third, high, medium, low, we want to use different techniques or a category, right? A color of hair of a person, you might express that differently in different ways. Another thing, I'm really zooming through these too, so I, I don't have much time to, to talk through it. Another really interesting thing is these Gestalt laws of grouping. The Gestalt laws, this is uh, the principle on which mo motion pictures work, right? You put a series of still pictures together and you, you play them rapidly and the human brain sees movement, right? And there's all sorts of different laws here and how we, how we put things in a visualization, we can exploit this, right? We can use this to show, to show trendings or have the eye pick out a shape that isn't actually there, right? And, and things like that. So let's try this out. This is from the Verizon Data Breach Report. We're showing uh, the types of threat agents over years, right? So what do you guys see here? We've got external in this greenish color, internal in this purple, and the, the partners. So what do, we, what do we see here? We see proportions. We see what? External is growing. Yeah, we see that growing, the right? The insider threat is BS. The <laughs> so that's actually a wrong story, and that's something I want to I, I cut out of here, that the insider, um, and in this case, maybe before I get into proportions, we'll talk about this real quick. In this case, what's happening is because we're talking about proportions from 
uh, external to internal. The story here actually is that the external is, is just exploding. And so as a result of that proportion, the insider is going down. So the number of insiders is going to be relatively flat. But because we're getting this explosion, it looks like the insider is going down. And so that's not conveyed well in that graphic, actually. So it's sort of a self-criticism. I think we can improve this particular visualization. So when we see proportions, right, we see like this one is 50% above this. We see about six times difference here and a really big. We don't see 20, but we see pretty big difference there in that one. And we also see relative length, right? The eye is seeing this trending. Everybody saw that trending of these two things. And we even saw a pattern of a, a triangle, the divergence of the two coming through here. Right? So this is what the eye is doing with this visualization. We're creating all of these patterns. And we're seeing that with a relatively simple bar chart. 3D pie charts. I, get, I gotta go here, guys. <laughs> So I can't remember which report I grabbed this from. I grabbed it from and just saved it off, and it's in here now. So uh, 3D and exploding, too. So the problem with this is that the eye sees a couple of things. We see in a pie chart, we see the angle. The angle of things, we see the area that is being covered, and we see art length. Right, so when we do 3D, now the area is expanded. So like this green, all of these become part of this area. That stuff becomes part of this area, this 1%. This becomes part of that in our eye, right? And we see that. So I made that a little bit more simpler, and I tried to take out the 3D aspect, right? And we see this very large area here, and that grows up in there. And it's very difficult for the brain to decode these things, right? So here's the same data with proportion and length, right? And it's pretty, pretty clear what we can see here and the differences. So let's keep talking about pie charts. That's my favorite pie chart, by the way. So there's two schools of thought on pie, char pie charts. The, the sort of uh, elitist thing, don't use them, they all suck. And then on the other side, people are, are starting to say now you can use them because people are learning, right? They are so ubiquitous. They're everywhere. People are learning how to decode them. And then in the middle ground, this is what I'm going to go with for pie charts, right? Never in 3D. Actually, that goes for any type of visualization. If you're going to do it in 3D, you shouldn't be doing it. Right, just try to avoid 3D at all costs. Uh, and then you want to limit the category. It's definitely not more than six. You want to try and limit that. You get more angles in there, and the brain just kind of freaks out and goes, a bunch of data. And so then you also want to start at 12 o'clock on it and avoid the angles that are really small. Like in that last one, we had a couple of 1% in there, and it's just like this blur of lines and stuff like that. So just use pie charts with some restrictions is all I ask. Here's a great example. This, uh, all, the, all the discussion on this particular pie chart is that this was completely intentional. A 3D pie chart, this is Steve Jobs down here, talking about Apple. And the, here's Apple represented in a bright green color. So you're using color for emphasis. It's tilted, it's in 3D, and it's tilted for this to be forward. So it's hard to tell in the picture, you've got this down here. So this area is smaller than this. <laughs> and that doesn't, you don't see that, right? I mean, you see this is huge. And that's really small, right? So the, the theory is this is completely intentional. This is an intentional use of 3D pie charts. All right, so now this is a data visualization I created. I just talked at an OWASP conference last week, and I thought I'd, I'd focus in, I'd go to the breaches that we have in the data breach report and look at all the web applications. So don't, don't try crazy stuff like this at home. This is pretty advanced stuff, OK? No, but this is representing all of the breaches that I looked at in the beginning, since the beginning of the data breach report. So we've got over 2,100 incidents that I looked at. And then within the various framework, there's a couple of different categories like uh, malware, hacking, social techniques, physical, things like that. So all of the breaches that had some type of a hacking technique included is here. About 53% of all the breaches had a hacking technique that we categorized. Out of that, the web app vector, that is, things that leverage the web application to attack, are in this portion. Now, this is showing relative area. So the brain has a, a difficult time with this. So you can see 20% of this is web app vector. Within that, we've got 53% involved SQL injection. A very large proportion of the web apps involve SQL injection. And here's another picture of that sort of stacked up. Right? And it was cool because I got, I got to OWASP and I 
there's, a, I don't know, maybe 150 people there. And I said, what, what percentage of all incidents are web app? Right? And the answer is all incidents about, about 10%. Someone shouted about 10%. I was like, great, who, who else has one? And there was a guy that just spoke that talked about pen testing and his focus is on pen testing web apps. And he shouts out 60%, you know, which is bigger than this square. It's bigger than all hacking, right? So a um, little bit of bias there from him, but it was just cool to, to be able to show this and show that relative proportion of that. And I'm gonna talk more about this later um, in the last section. So this is another one that I did. This is, as we talk about com conveying and communicating complexity, this is over 100 million data points. So in the report, we have things where we talk about opportunistic attackers, right? Huge proportion, like 80% of the breaches that we see are from attackers scanning the internet, finding a weakness, and exploiting it, right? Um, and so I thought if they're just scanning the internet, we should see that. We should be able to take any host whatsoever on the internet, start recording packets. And so I did that. And so this is over a 70-day period, and it, for every second in that 70-day period, I recorded basically when the next packet was seen from every second, right? So, and this, all of these show a distribution. And this is a TCP port along the bottom. So, and these are, are called a, a box plot. So this line in the middle is the, the mean, or the uh, mode. So 50% of the time, we saw something f faster than the line there. And then 50% of the time, it was over that. Right? And then I also show the average. I call it the average here and various things. So we can see if we throw RDP, if we throw the RDP service up there, it's going to be discovered, that is, it's going to receive a packet. Whether that's malicious or not, I didn't test that, but it'll be over here, right, under two hours. So if you open up RDP to the internet, there's a really good chance within, at least within three hours, that it's going to be discovered, right? So um, I was asked a, a few months ago at a conference, um, how do we assess the risk of business rules for firewalls? Right? And I was like, well, why, don't, why don't you do something like this? I hadn't created this at the time, but if you go out and look, you can see the traffic. Right? If you want to know if you're going to open something up for a couple of days for a developer, you're going to want to know what kind of traffic you're going to see in a couple of days. Right? So this isn't precise. These are distributions. We have no idea what you're actually going to see, but we can be pretty sure that the 3128, what is that, squid management port, it's going to be less detected, less often, than RDP or Microsoft SQL Server. Right? We can make statements like that now. So this is another thing. I'll start this off. So this, this is the same data, basically. This is a 30-day period. And so I, I used that Gestalt law and I created a video. So these are packets. This is where each uh, image is a 30-minute window. And I'm showing all the ports lighting up as packets are received. Right? So, and across here, we're seeing how many packets per day are we seeing. So we're about, at peak here, about 1,400. Day 14, someone actually does a full scan, and the whole thing lights up. It's mesmerizing, isn't it? This is out on YouTube, and on the video, I talked the whole time over this thing. So if you want to hear me talk more, you can <laughs> check it out on YouTube. It's down here. Um, but yes, yeah, so, I mean, you can see things here, like uh, 3389 right here going crazy, 1433 for Microsoft SQL. Um, we're coming up on day 14, and we'll see a, a sequential port scan where they did, uh, well, you'll see it. It'll come up right about there. <laughs> so, and that was the only time there was a full sequential port scan. So all of this uh, data that I collected, I did three series of uh, three blog posts at the Verizon blog, and I found that most of the ports lit up once, right? From a source IP address, they would try one port and move on, right? Like 97, 93% of the attackers did that. Tried one port and kept on going. So that supports that notion of uh, opportunistic just scanning for a single vulnerability. All right, so here's, as we create a visualization, we want to keep three points in mind. And this is from a site called junkcharts.com. And we start out with this, what is the practical question? Which is two things, right? What is the question we want to answer, and is it practical? A lot of things fail that second part. Um, and then we want to grab the data, and what does the data say? What is the story within the data? And then when we create something, are we telling that same story? Do, do these two match, right? Does what we're trying to convey 
match what the data says. We don't, we don't want to stray from the truth here. All right, so this, this is a visualization that I did trying to show that point. Um, I had a chance to um, debate risk analysis with Marcus Ranum, and at the end, he's not a, a fan of risk analysis, by the way. So at the, at the end of the conversation, um, he asked me this question. He's like, all right, all right, smart boy. If I walk into a casino with $100,000, what am I going to walk out with at the end of the night? Right? And he's like, whatever you say, you're going to be wrong. And I thought for a minute, I was like, what if I give you a distribution? Am I going to be wrong with that? And so th I, I walked away from that conversation, and I took it as a challenge right, to actually go ahead and try to calculate if you walk to a casino with a big wad of cash, what are you going to walk out with? So the first thing I did is I, I made some assumptions. I limited the, the scope, and I said, let's focus on roulette. Roulette is a game that is entirely just random chance. There's no other players. We can calculate the odds to an unbelievable degree. So I created this visualization. I said, let's pretend there's 20,000 people that play roulette for a night and assume they do about 250 spins. And uh, so I did this simulation, right? So this is people starting out at zero, and I just said $5 bets. Whatever the bet is, it just changes this axis, not the outcome. And so this line right here, this is betting on a single number. These are people that lost the entire night, OK? And then these are people, when they jump up to this dense line here, this is when people won once the whole night, right? And then you get people winning a lot more than others, and you get that long. But this is the distribution of the output. And you can see this is breaking even, and the peak is just underneath it, right? This is how the casinos make their money. They, they take in a little bit more than they lose. And so I did that for all of the bets within roulette, right? And this is, isn't this pretty? I mean, this is just, this is pretty. And then uh, I compared them all. So what we can say is if we look at roulette, um, if you want to play it safe, go for the one-to-one uh, -one payouts, the even odd, uh, green, red, or whatever those are. You're not going to win as much, but you're not going to lose as much, and you're going to win more often. Right? So if you like winning, go for that. If you're really risk-seeking, you might go over for that single number. Right? You can win a whole lot more, but you're going to lose a whole lot more too. So this is just a way to convey that, uh, trying to answer that question. Right? And then, of course, if you're not going to play roulette, this doesn't apply at all, but... All right, so this is another thing as we talk about what is the practical question. I actually start out with some exploratory data analysis on this, and I tried to make a connection between the size of an organization and the threat actions that they see. And what I found in the data is that the, the numbers assigned uh, to the type of threat actions and the size of the organization could not happen by chance. That is, there's some type of a pattern behind the data. So I wanted to convey that, right? So this is called a slope graph. Anybody guess why? The slopes here are what we're determining the change. And the position here helps us understand relative position on, the, on the each side. So this is organizations with less than 1,000 employees, more than 1,000 employees. So over here, we've, I think what we see is less security maturity. Right Up at the top, we've got key loggers, number one thing. Underneath that, default or guessable credentials. Right? So these are pretty easy things to fix. And you see the huge drop coming down here. The default credentials comes down to 5% down here of all the breaches in large organizations. But what's interesting is this third one, the uh, use of stolen credentials relatively flat. Right? So this is a problem that we see across every organization. The attackers are going after identities. Right? That once they get an identity, it's a little bit easier to move around the network and be a little bit easier to be, go undetected. So the practical question here is what is the, the difference? Right? Can, can we visualize that difference? The story here is that there's, there's a pattern. And then this is trying to reflect what that pattern is, trying to get that in that visualization. So um, one of the things, too, that, that I try to focus on, you know, I, I hear people say that they study statistics, so they can kind of uh, absorb charts and absorb, f figure out when people are lying, that people focus on that. And I'm kind of the opposite. I want to study statistics. I'm, I'm just enrolled in a master's program in statistics. I want to do it so I don't screw up, right? I, I want to do the right thing. When I've got a chunk of data, I don't want to screw up with it. I want to do well. So these are um, seven stages, I believe, from Stephen Few, Stephen Fry. Um, and we've got the, the seven stages, so acquiring, 
really important. I'll talk about that. And some of these we don't have to do, like data mining. This is what you know the big data craze is all about. Let's actually um, discern patterns and, and keep it in context. Focus on that uh, the, the really nitty gritty stuff, things that we couldn't see by the naked eye. But most of the stuff that we can do is simple counting. Let's just parse it. You know, most of the data breach report is counting. We've got these many breaches, and then these many are something of, of some attribute of those breaches. So here's, here's something I came across on Twitter. So we have to be really careful about how data is acquired. <laughs> so the, the funny thing here is that it's a, a Twitter poll about what social media are you using. So the, the target audience are Twitter users. So there's obviously going to be a little bit of bias there in the, the output. All right, so flat out lying. A lot of these samples come from Fox News. <laughs> so this is something they put up there. The, the problem here is that they don't start at zero. So the I see is proportion, right? You see, here's what we have. And it is going to, like, five, six times our taxes are going to just absolutely go through the roof. And then the reality is, I mean, this is the difference. Right? Here's another one, again, Fox News. A um, little problem with math on these. Uh, this is a really interesting one, and it's subtle. Right? So they talk about job loss by quarter, and then they pull out random months <laughs> within this thing. And here I created it so you can see the 1st, the 10th, the 16th, and the 31st to support their story. Right, so don't, don't do this crazy stuff. <laughs> all right, I had a lot more there and I cut that out because I was trying to trim this down, so. All right, so here's some recent work I did. Um, F-Secure released, uh, very, very nice of them to release this. They did a bunch of research on the zero axis botnet and they released uh, about 140,000 latitude and longitude of these IP addresses. So they took the IP address, they didn't release that, but they released the geolocation information from it. So 140,000 entries of this, right? A country, lat, longitude. So the first thing, uh, I worked with a guy named Bob Rudis on this. I had a great time doing it, pardon me. And one of the things we did is uh, we, we found the data for internet users per state. Are you thinking about Potwin? <laughs> what years so in Kansas, right, we had that same question. So Potwin, Kansas had a bot count of 800. The next biggest town was Houston, Texas at 239. Potwin has a population of 400, <laughs> okay? We knew something was wrong. And it took us days. I mean, we had no idea. We were trying to figure out what is in Potwin, Kansas. Is there like a huge ISP there or something that all these IP addresses were going? Absolutely not. You know, they're a small rural town. Um, so one of the things I figured out is I, I was thinking about geolocation, IP geolocation. They start with big and they go down. So the first thing they know is who, uh, what country is a block of IP addresses registered to. And if they can't go down from there, they're going to stick at the country level. So does anybody want to guess where the geographical center of the US is located? Potwin, Kansas. So we had to toss that data out. But this is what uh, F-Secure released. So if we talk about data visualization, this is really, really computationally expensive, by the way, using Google Earth to plot 140,000 points. Um, I don't know how they had the time for that, but so this is what they came out with, and this is what I created. This is using a language called R. Um, it's a, a language created by statisticians and has all of this data analysis and data visualization stuff built right in. Really fantastic language. So we see this spread here across the world. They also did one on just the U.S., and I did one on just the U.S. Right now, what is what is the story here? What what can we pull out from this map? Now, it's kind of hard. This is what we see. We see, and I actually did the, the, the number crunching on this, and it is just almost perfectly correlated with population. So a very small fraction of the population gets infected with botnets. Where they are located is a complete reflection of population density, nothing having to do with anything about the bot. All right, so you guys remember this data, right? The web app stuff? So I'm going to walk through some of my thinking about creating this um, new visualization that I came up with for this stuff, trying to convey it. So I took the web applications and I took them per year. And I just calculated the percentage of breaches that we had in the year and then percentage that were web app. 
right? Now the problem with this is that in 2004, we had like 20 cases, right? We had very little data, so we've got a lot of uncertainty there. So the first thing I did though is I saw, you know, that black is kind of, kind of too much, so I made it gray. And then I had the notion of confidence intervals, um, or margin of error. So this is, this is a, a plot I did having nothing to do with information security, but Nate Silver, uh, have you guys heard of him during the election, big stats guy? Um, so he made predictions, and a lot of people focus on did he predict the right states to win? But knowing that he did it with a margin of error, uh, what I want to know that margin of error is calculated with a 95% confidence. So in theory, you should be wrong 5% of the time. Right? That means that you're accurate. Right? When you're wrong 5% of the time with a 95% confidence, you're accurate. So I created this, and I said, right, so like for example, in Alabama, he said, Obama 36.7 plus or minus 3.8%. So I created a line. And then the day after the election, I showed the result. So you can see these are the, the amount of confidence. So like this is really long. This was an uncontested state, so there were less polls, less data, longer line. And things that were contested, it's a shorter line. A lot more polls occurred there. So it was pretty accurate all the way through this. Right? And there's 50 states plus DC, and he ended up getting um, just over 5% incorrect at this point. And there, there were, apparently he was more accurate because more places had reported after this. So that's what I, I went back to this and I said, I want to do confidence intervals. Right? So we're really, uh, we don't have much confidence in this one because we don't have much data, but when we get down to here, we get much shorter confidence because we've got a lot more data in 2010 and 2011. And then uh, the bar chart was kind of confusing, so I, invert, I put the black dot and then I inverted it. And then I wanted to show the total count. So you can see in 2010, 2011, we've got a lot more down here. We've got 85, it's kind of hard to see the light, light gray bar, 63 here. So we've got more breaches and more total breaches. So we can say pretty sure, we're pretty sure that the actual value is somewhere in this bar with 95% confidence, right? So I, I applied that to more than just year. So at the top here, this is all breaches. So take a look at finance and insurance there, fourth from the bottom. Roughly somewhere around 20% of their breaches, of all their breaches on information, uh, involves web app. When we look down here, this is just hacking now. So what, what we've taken out is the physical attacks against ATM tampering that the finance insurance sees. So we see finance and insurance in the hacking realm, somewhere between 60 and 80% of their breaches involve web applications, right? So I was kind of happy to stand up in front of OWASP and be like, hey, you guys are really important. <laughs> Doing good stuff here. Um, so this is an interesting way to look at that. You can see manufacturing, we don't have much data at all. So when we can say between 20 and 60% of the breaches, right? That's not, that's not too helpful. So, uh, to understand the placement, I wanted to show all the other vectors, all the other paths for doing hacking techniques. So at the very top, we've got RDP, right? That type of service. So RDP and VNC, things like that, remote desktop sharing stuff. And then you've got backdoors. So there's some type of a malware event that got a backdoor in the environment, and that's how they're coming into the environment. That's the path they're using. Web application third, this is across all incidents. And the other thing to call out is that I'm talking about DBIR qualifying incidents. These are not all incidents, right? So these are things where they were discovered and they brought in external help at some level. So gotta keep that in mind. If we look at just the hacking incidents, it mainly just shifts up a little bit, right? But when we start looking at small and large organizations, here's small, pretty high proportion, or RDP, right? And the small organization, as we get to large, that shifts around. Large organizations, the first problem is, is probably the web app followed by backdoors to get into their environment. And so also showing that confidence, it could be that, that the backdoors are a little bit more of a problem than, than the, the web app, but we're expressing our uncertainty, right? We see data and we're expressing our uncertainty in what the data may or may not be telling us. And this is a, I showed this stuff to Bob Reus and he called it my TIE fighter charts. So we'll see if that sticks. So I throw that in there. All right, to wrap up, do I have time? 20 minutes after. So uh, one of the things I really want to stress is that we need to tell stories with the data. It's really important that we focus on that pragmatic question, that practical question, and be able to tell stories. Right? If we don't have a story to tell or if we don't have a practical question, we might not want to be pursuing it. 
right? And then you want to focus on the audience. So one of the things I didn't cover is that you don't want to create the same visualization for an operations uh, desk as you would for a CISO. Right? It's a totally different audience. You want to focus on that. And then you want to um, focus on the data first. Make sure that you have the right story from the data first. And then focus on the visualization. You don't want to try and learn from the data too much just from the visualization, although it's a technique. And then finally, don't lie or screw up with the data. Just fo focus on doing the right thing. And with that, any questions? There's a, there's a really cool set out there called Google, and I use it a whole bunch. No, I'm, I'm serious, no, but I am mostly serious. I mean, there's, there's a tremendously huge community around data visualization and the, the R language in general. So R is, is my main tool of choice right now. Um, Python has a whole bunch of tools for it as well for doing data visualization. Um, and with this explosion of big data, there's just been an explosion of tools to go with it. Right, we've got Tableau and, and all the JavaScript tools. We've got D3 and Protoviz and all sorts of tools like that. Just starting to search for it, and you just unlock like just tons of blogs, and there's a ton of sites focused on data visualization. And one of the things that they do in, the, in this field is that they'll have contests. Right, so as, as someone learning, you can go out and find a contest any day of the week. You know, and they say, hey, here's data. See what you can do with it and submit it. It's like Forbes is running one right now. Um, and then there's a ton of data visual visualization sites. Visual.ly, visualizing.org. Um, I had a few on there, data stories. Um, just a ton of things out there about focusing on this. So, yep. Uh, yeah, MIT Coursera has um, some R courses. I think, they, I think I saw one on data viz through Coursera. So, yeah, it's another group. MIT, I think Stanford. University of Texas. University of Texas. Okay. Yeah, so there's a lot of resources out there. So. All right, well, I'll be around for a while. If you have any questions, I'll, I'll hang around. Thank you.